full size Merlin engines, which we take around the air shows and steam rallies and all sorts of events. Um, so the people can kind of see the engine more close up running. And uh, after we've had our lunch later on, we'll get everyone, everyone behind the crowd barrier there and you'll be able to see it running and what it can do. Um, I'll just give you a brief sort of history about the Merlin without going really technical with it. Um, can you see if you don't actually? <laughs> thought you meant me there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the, um, the engine was conceived first in 1933 and it was called the PV-12. It was a private venture because there wasn't a government contract for that for it, but it was Rolls-Royce realised after the success they'd had with the, um, the R-Type engine in the Schneider type of um, Supermarine S6 that the, they were going to be in good competition for a gap in the market for a thousand horsepower engine for fighter aircraft which had um, a small frontal area, a fairly light engine with power to weight ratio and also with the potential to develop it to make more power which of course they subsequently did. Um, the PV-12 engine wasn't a great success, it had a single piece crankcase which means that that big casting there that's bare metal that might go up to the cylinder head, it's like a car engine, um, it was a very large casting. Junkers did it with the Yumo engine quite successfully, it would have made the engine lighter, they had problems with it. Um, they also put a, a separate cylinder head on the engine with a ramp design combustion chamber so it wasn't flat. Again, they had problems with that. I mean, it was getting away from what they knew. So they, they had a rethink. I don't know when it would have been. You know, Within a couple of years, they redesigned it based on the Kestrel engine, which was a smaller 21.2 litre V12. Um, so they were going back to the devil they knew because the cylinder block on the Kestrel, which was a single piece bank with no separate head joints in the casting, used to leak. They had, had problems with coolant leakage. Um, but at least they knew what they were doing there. So, um, 1937, the engine was test flown. It got its hours in, its um, 100 hour type test in a horse horsely. Um, and so, the first engines that went into service, which was primarily the Merlin 2 and 3 in the early Spitfires and Hurricanes, were producing 1,030 horsepower. Um, they could produce 1,000 horsepower because they were supercharged. They could produce that power up to 16,000 feet, which is a pretty good going. Um, and the aircraft would have had a ceiling of about 32,000. By 1944, the Spitfire Mark 9 with the Merlin 66 engine in it, which was a two stage supercharger, um, 2,050 horsepower at low level. It could also produce 1,000 horsepower up to uh, about 30, 32,000 feet, I believe it is. Um, and it had a ceiling, some of them right up to 47,000 feet, so they basically doubled the power of the engine. And they went on um, after the war to make somewhere in the region of 2,300 horsepower and 2,600 in the test bed, but they did 100 hour type tests, which is where they were looking to see what breaks on the engine and strengthen it and so on, at quite high powers. Um, of course the war ended, and uh, so thankfully they didn't need to put these in at the aircraft. Um, but the it also put, um, I think about 80 miles an hour onto the top speed of the Spitfire, because it ended up at 420 miles an hour with, with the late Mark of Merlin in it. Um, and of course it was also used in the P-51 Mustang, because Packard started building the engine in 1942. They built some 50,000 out of the 160,000 that were built in total. Um, and that put 100 miles an hour to the top speed of the Mustang straight away. In fairness, the Allison V12, which the Mustang had in it originally, was sort of got a bad press. I think the biggest problem with the Allison engine um, was the fact that it didn't have a good supercharger, so it didn't have the altitude Excuse support. Can I just interrupt you? Has anybody got the cars that are blocking the, the road, please? At the end there. Has <coughs> anybody got the two cars at the end that are blocking the road? We've got two fire engines standing in here. It's not on fire, are we? No, but weren't we out on fire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 it really might be. I think they've come in since because these yeah. people have been in the lecture. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, yeah. 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 Um, Mustang, yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the num as I say, 160,000 of these things were built during the war. I mean, probably primarily by women, actually. Um, the sort of production numbers they have were Spitfires and Seafires, um, 
fitted with the Merlin, of course later on they went on to use different engines, and they built 20,000 of those, um, 14 and a half thousand Hawker Hurricanes, 7,000 Lancasters, I mean Christ, look at what's in an Avro Lancaster, I mean that's 30,000 Merlin engines to start with, and if you see the complexity, I find it quite staggering what, um, you know, how on earth we managed to do that in such a short time, because it's a relatively short space of years that we've got this production going. Um, I mean, even the Mosquito, I built 7,700 Mosquitoes. Um, this particular engine um, is out of a German Heinkel 111, so that's a bit disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do run the Bowfighter Merlin um, in the, quite normally on this trailer. Um, the, when the Bowfighter was being in 1940, it had Bristol Hercules engine, um, and at the same time they were building the short Sterling, the four engine with heavy bomber, and um, there was a shortage of engines, so Morris Cars, in, in conjunction with Rolls-Royce at Huffman, produced a power plant, which is an engine change unit, which sort of differs from previous practice, because you unbolt it from these points here, and take the whole engine and cowlings away, and put another one on quite easily, and it was made, interestingly, to replace Hercules, um, virtually on the same firewall, there's very little difference. Um, and what makes it interesting basically is that it was, the, it was what was chosen to put on the Avro Lancaster later on when they had problems with the Manchester, so they wanted a four engined bomber, so they put sections in the wing, and that was the power plant they could get hold of. And so it actually became the Lancaster power plant, which is what all this is. I mean, the radiator and so on was all originally developed from the bow fighter, Mark II. Um, so this is actually a post-war um, rebuilt engine. Um, it was built in 1944 by Ford, because Ford had trapped the park in Manchester built, I don't know how many, and they built an awful lot of these, what you call 20 series engines, for um, primarily for the Lancaster. Um, and, and so it flew until the end of the war, and then it went all over the war. So I know it was probably in a Lancaster bomber. Um, of course, CASA in Spain were building the Heinkel 111 the bomber right from, I believe, 1940. So it was in use during the war. By the end of the war, they wanted to carry on using them. <coughs> um, they didn't have access to Junkers engines anymore, uh, and spares and so on. So uh, they didn't have a lot of the Heinkel. Um, they didn't make a huge number of them anyway, but I mean, a lot of them was, well, they made 236. Um, so, X number of these things, probably not very many were still in service and they couldn't keep them maintained. So, Rolls Royce supplied them with a civilian Merlin engine, which was actually the one used in the Avro York. Um, and uh, they were painted a horrible blue colour normally when they come back from the side. Yeah. And so, it's, it's a high modification standard late engine. And an interesting point with them is you can't now put this engine back in the single seat fighter plane, for example, because it's been used by the Spanish as a multi engine. Installation. And they used to do all sorts of strange things with their machining on the crankcases and the like, so nobody quite knows of these things what uh, well they do when you, when you open the engine up. But they've been uh, oh, yeah. re lined for the crankcase and this type of thing quite often. Um, when, when they finished with it, and I don't know anything about the date, but this engine also went in to drive the wind tunnels to bust them down. Um, so that was the last time it was used uh, before we had it. Um, and of course, the, the, this wind tunnel is still driven by Merlin. And there's no bother putting diesel engines in and just to these things. It's a great big fan in the end of the, um, in the wind tunnel. But uh, just, again, without getting too technical, um, just to roughly explain a bit about what, what the engine is. Um, it's a V12, as we see. I mentioned about the cylinder head earlier on. When you look at it close up, you can see that there's a cylinder head joint there. The early engines, that casting from there to there was one piece, and the line is used to go up from underneath it. Um, in 1942, this was introduced, and it was also introduced when Packard started production as well. Um, and the reason you don't get coolant leaks with this type is because the cylinder liner Flat, has a flange at the top of it and it's sandwiched in that joint there. So any coolant that it's going to leave, which they don't anyway, will not go into the cylinders. And that, that's the key point to it. So it might leak outside the engine, it's not going to leak into the cylinders. Um, but, um, 